what appears to have happened is that they sent two agents, Jack Kohler and Ron Williams, onto the Jumping Bull property under a pretext of serving a warrant on a guy they knew wasn't there in order to provoke an armed altercation with the people who were inside, who were expected to be eight fighters. Once the fighting broke out, then they expected to be reinforced by an approximate 150 SWAT trained personnel that were pre-positioned in the immediate area and they just roll up the aim camp, but they would also have a sensational incident that would allow the FBI to bring extraordinary force to bear on the reservation to finish this off once and for all, this little war they had going, because they hadn't been able to destroy the movement. They had not been able to destroy the resistance despite the degree of physical pain that had been inflicted over the preceding two and a half years. The first appeal, there were 31 reversible errors found in the record, okay? The head of the three-judge panel of the Eighth Circuit Court who heard the first appeal decided nonetheless, despite the fact that he had 31 potential opportunities to reverse and send this back to trial, that he would not do so. Of the 31 reversible errors, 19 involved FBI misconduct. Uh, they, when the oil company workers arrive, uh, it's, it's not a matter of choice. They take the women, um, and once the women have been taken, they, it, the process goes on. They become prostitutes of the oil company workers. Because our development isn't about getting money in order to buy a can of tuna fish. Our development is not for domination, it's to share. Native Americans in the Western Hemisphere are still being suppressed, continuing this several centuries tradition. We will emphasize what is happening to one Native American in the United States and what is happening in Peru when the oil companies come down to the Amazon. We talk about all this right now on Alternative Views. This Alternative View spotlights two examples of today's repression of Native Americans in this hemisphere. One is an American, and the others are people from Peru. First, we have Ward Churchill, who's a professor at the University of Colorado, the author of many books, and a member of the American Indian Movement. He'll tell us about a political prisoner in the United States. Next, we'll interview Amir Etsam Nunquan, who is with COICA, the coordinating body of the indigenous people's organization of the Amazon Basin. This is where the oil companies are muscling in. But before we talk to our guests, here are some news stories. It seems to be more and more information coming out of the pr health problems which the veterans of the Gulf War have. I was listening to a call-in program uh, last night on KRLD, and it seems that there are so many factors that are causing the problems, health problems of the veterans. Uh, a new one that I heard was that Navy people, in particular Navy ship, were getting sick and have had dire health consequences because the uh, water desalination uh, mechanism on the ship did not remove the toxins from the water which they used for drinking. And so even though they were, you know, out at sea, they may have been inhaling a lot of the uh, oil fumes and all, but I thought the Navy maybe was relatively safe, but not so. No, in fact, uh, even worse were the conditions for the folks in Kuwait who were occupying Kuwait after the war and subject to the smoke from the oil fires. There's been quite a few stories in the media recently about all the health pro problems they're having, plus the folks that were in the deserts in Saudi Arabia for months on end got all kinds of uh, Ill mysterious illnesses. There were flies that were biting them, transmitting mysterious diseases. They were also the veterans of the Gulf War suffering from psychological stress syndrome. In some parts of the country, 
fifty percent of the gulf veterans have had marriage problems there's been separations of fifty percent of the folks that served in the gulf war because of the psychological stress that they had suffered there and the inability to adjust coming back to the u.s. and evidently the veterans administration is doing very very little to help with these medical or psychological problems and are making the claim that these are all psychosomatic and just denying the existence of serious medical and psychological questions, just like Vietnam, the same thing. Well, they're actually also making a, a very bureaucratic decision or non-decision. They're saying that, well, yes, the guys are sick, they have a problem, but we don't have a category to cover this type of illness. Mm -hmm. And so they're not giving these people any help at all. But there's also a, a question as to uh, how much of a factor these uh, the sicknesses may be prompted by the various vaccines that were given to these That's people. That's a very too. important uh, fact because 500,000 of the Gulf troops that were in Saudi Arabia were used as guinea pigs in the biggest medical experiment in history. There were vaccinations for chemical and biological warfare that had never been tested on anyone before. And we know that some people died from these vaccines, some people got very sick. And this could be another one of the causes of these mysterious lingering ailments that have hit the Gulf veterans after the war. So this was really no cakewalk for the uh, Gulf uh, veterans. They didn't get shot up like in Vietnam on the battlefield, but they brought a lot of problems back with them, just like the um, Gulf, the veterans of the Vietnam War. On this KRLD uh, talk program, they had a, a medical um, uh, they ha had a doctor, a medical doctor, who is doing research into this. He and his center on uh, uh, environmental problems. And uh, uh, he was saying that the big problem that the veterans are having and that the medical, well, the medical establishment doesn't know anything about it. It's such a new thing and they've ignored it. But the problem is, is that they try to treat one symptom and it'll exacerbate the others because there can be so many different types of things going on and it's extremely difficult to treat. This is experimental medicine. They just yeah. don't know what's uh, going on. It seems like Clinton's going to do very little to stop the free trade juggernaut that George Bush set in motion. In a recent article in the January uh, Progressive called The Free Trade Sellout, they tell us some of the regulations and rules that have been set by communities in the U.S. and overturned under GATT tribunals just recently or other free trade tribunals. As we said before in Alternative Views, the uh, GATT agreement, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, requires the quote-unquote harmonization of U.S. laws with other international laws and international standards. Now, these standards are not set by legislators. They're set by trade trade panels, which include mostly rep representatives from corporations and from the government bureaucracies that are administering the areas of trade. One of these panels, the Codex Alimentarius in Rome, represents multinational food corporations. In fact, 16 of the 28 U.S. delegates to the Codex represent food or agrochemical multinationals, including three officials from Nestle, one each from Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Hershey, Ralston, Purina, Kraft, and CPC International and other representatives from Nestle that from their subsidiaries in other nations. In fact, Nestle has so many delegates on the panel that they outnumber that of most nations. We can look to the past to see what some of the future is going to be like under the GATT Treaty. Canada used, in 1988, used the Free Trade Agreement to challenge the U.S.'s ban on the importation and manufacture of asbestos. The Environmental Protection Agency claimed that this ban would save almost 1,900 lives by the end of the decade, but Quebec, a province with a substantial interest in asbestos mining, led the opposition and argued that a ban was not the least trade-distorting alternative. Now, a least trade-distorting alternative is the only legal standard that can be set up by a nation when they want to set up an environmental or health or safety regulation. In, an Oct in October 1991, the U.S. Court of Appeals upheld the Canadian objection because the EPA had rejected alternatives that were less burdensome to industry. In other words, after the U.S., under its own sovereign legislature, had set up a ban on asbestos, under this trade tribunal, we had to overturn that. Also, the U.S. Marine Mammal Protection Act authorized a ban on the importation of tuna caught in purse nets. This ban was impl implemented to stop 
to protect endangered dolphins, which are killed in the tens of thousands every year by the use of these nets. But Mexico challenged the ban, and it was overturned by the panel. We can look forward to seeing all sorts of environmental regulations overturned by these panels in the future under both the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and the GATT. So watch out. Dollars and Cents has another article on NAFTA, and it says that, oh yes, there is a green, green area of NAFTA. The uh, William Riley, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, says it's one of the finest uh, agreements that the, in the world, and it says that uh, it prevents com countries from relaxing their health, safety, and environmental standards to attract uh, uh, foreign investment, but it really doesn't do this. The text does not actually prohibit such a move. It only deems it inappropriate if somebody uh, comes down there to Mexico and relaxes the health, safety, or environmental standards. But what if they, are, uh, they do find they are in violation? What happens? Well, the injured party should request consultations, but there is no legal recourse. In addition, NAFTA states that technical standards imposed by the pact refer only to the end product, not the way it's uh, manufactured. So, for instance, an electrical appliance maker that dumped toxic waste into a Mexican stream could freely export these safe products to the United States or Canada. It's strictly a one-way thing for the international capital and zapping the environment and people. Well, a major financial crisis, a scandal, is shaking the Kuwaiti ruling circles, calling for demands by the parliament, by the public, and by even prosecutors to wrest control of public money from the ruling al-Sabah family. At the time of the Gulf War, the Kuwaiti investment holdings had at least $100 billion. I've even seen some figures that they had $200 billion. That was a major source of revenues that even took in more in interest every year on their investment fund for the future, they called it, than they got from oil revenues. So this was a big time public investment corporation that supposedly belonged to all of the people of the Kuwaiti nation, although it was managed by the al-Sabah family. And now there's claims that it was mismanaged, that the $100 billion is down to maybe $20 billion since the Ooh. frittering away of this money beginning during the Gulf War, where at least $34 billion was directly spent on the war effort by the Kuwaiti government that dipped into their investment fund to pay some of the U.S. and allied bills. Twenty billion more went down the tubes to compensate banks whose biggest customers evidently kept their money outside of the country and didn't pay back all of their loans. And so the Kuwaiti investment fund subsidized the big banks in that country to cover their losses, just like the SNL crisis and banking crisis losses in the U.S. are being met by the U.S. federal government. But at least four or five billion dollars has simply disappeared in an investment in Spain that was run by three members of the Al Sabah family that are under criminal investigation now because the money was either mismanaged, it was lost, or else it was just simply stolen by these uh, folks. There's other scandals also, a uh, shipping uh, scandal in which uh, a lot of money that was paid off to uh, tanking companies during the Gulf War also uh, disappeared. There were also some scams involved here. So for the first time, it appears that the Kuwaiti government, the al Sabah family, is really getting attacked by its own public and parliament for mismanagement of the nation's uh, funds that could destabilize the uh, ruling Kuwaiti regime. In December, Lies of Our Times, they have a story about what happens to, uh, well, one particular product, product which they tracked uh, when it is banned in the United States but then shipped overseas. Uh, one of the most outrageous examples it notes is the no pest strips by Shell. Shell, uh, Mexico particularly, is a subsidiary of Royal Dutch Shell. And these strips were taken off the market in the United States in 1979, despite fierce resistance by the company. 
because the active ingredient, DDVP, was linked to nerve damage, cancer, and aplastic anemia. However, the strips are selling very briskly in Mexico. Now, before the strips were banned in the United States, the manufacturer was required to include a warning not to hang the strips in rooms occupied by babies, the elderly, the infirm, or areas where food was processed. So, what do you have down in Mexico? Well, they have a nice bit of advertising where they show that the best place to put them are in the kitchen, in the bedroom, and above a smiling baby in a crib. Uh, Lute, uh, Lies of Our Times, mentions they talked to a pathologist who served as EPA's Environmental Protection Agency's carcinogen assessment team in the 1970s, and he said that there was overwhelming evidence at the time that DDVP was carcinogenic, but the EPA Science Advisory Panel uh, just didn't want to take DDVP off the market. They claimed they'd already canceled other Shell products, and they didn't want to cancel all of Shell's pesticides. It hurt the feelings of that poor company. Hmm. That's all the time we have for news. Now for the heart of this Alternative Views program, the suppression of Native Americans in the Western Hemisphere. First, one from the United States, followed by what is happening to the Native Americans in Peru. Ward Churchill, who's a member of the American Indian Movement and author of many books, including Agents of Repression, The Fantasies of the Master Race, and The Struggle for the Land that are published by South End Press. The uh, movie incident, incident at uh, Oglala has received a lot of uh, uh, fame. A lot of people have been seeing it. Uh, can you tell us about uh, that movie and uh, the principal person involved? Well, the principal person involved as a subject of the film is a man named Leonard Peltier, who is sitting in a cage at Leavenworth Federal Prison right now as a result of being accused of having killed two FBI agents who were in the process of engaging in an armed invasion of the Oglala Lakota, or Pine Ridge Reservation, located, as Russell Means would put it, between Nebraska and South Dakota, meaning it's on the South Dakota-Nebraska line, but he doesn't acknowledge as being part of either state as an independent nation, in his view, and by law should be considered that way as well. During the 1970s, the American Indian Movement, which has sometimes been referred to as the shock troops of Indian sovereignty, took a stand on the Pine Ridge Reservation under the provisions of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty to insist upon the exercise of Indian treaty rights there, to self-determination, economic self-sufficiency, jurisdiction over their own property, and so on. These are legal points that are brought out in U.S. as well as international law. That was such a threatening concept to the federal government, the idea that its own law would be enforced with regard to Indians, that it sent in essentially counterinsurgency specialists from the United States Army, from the Pentagon, the 82nd Airborne Division, and from Fort Bragg, and a number of counterintelligence specialists from the Federal Bureau of Investigation to mount what in their internal documents they refer to as a suppression of insurgents. They engaged in an exercise of counterinsurgency within the borders of the United States within the past 20 years. The counterinsurgency is not a law enforcement technique. I want to make this clear. It's not taught in police academies. It's taught at the Special Warfare School. It is a technique that is employed. It's a doctrine, in fact, which is taught at the War College and a set of techniques employed by groups like the Special Forces. This was applied inside the United States on people who were construed by the government of the United States, rightly or wrongly, and I would argue wrongly, but nonetheless they viewed the people who were the targets of this as being citizens, the domestic citizenry of the United States. They fought the South over a three-year period of time, beginning in 1973, ending sometime in mid-1976, primarily through use of a surrogate, surrogate organization called the Goons, Guardians of the Ogala Nation, which were commanded, controlled, funded, in fact, founded by federal agencies, primarily the FBI. The goons were equipped by the FBI with automatic weapons, armor-piercing ammunition, various explosive devices. They were provided with field intelligence and so on by the FBI to go out and neutralize, and that's the term they employed, members of the opposition, American Indian Movement members and American Indian Movement supporters, members of the grassroots traditional organizations among the Oglala Lakotas, 
in order to end this drive towards treaty rights and self-determination. As a consequence, a minimum of 69 members and supporters of AIM died during that period of time. The FBI, which exercised primary jurisdiction on the reservation during that period, did nothing to prevent it. In fact, made various awards to certain of the participating members. A number of these murders were witnessed. Um, in each case where there were witnesses, the killers or the assailants were identified as being members of this goon squad, which in effect functioned as a death squad for purposes of imposing a certain political control, political order upon the colonized people there. Along about 1975, for the first time, the traditionals were just getting hammered by this. They're sustaining casualties, not just fatalities, but there's another 340-odd people who were seriously physically assaulted on this reservation. And it's only 10,000 people. You got a death rate there. You got a, a political violence rate there that is comparable to nothing in the United States in the 20th century, but is rather comparable to the repression of the left in Chile after the Pinochet coup in which Salvador Allende is overthrown. That level of violence, not in terms of the size of the pile of body, but in terms of the proportionate rate at which the violence is occurring. You got the traditionals there asking to provide them with armed security. The alternative is either to abandon the political struggle or to engage in armed security to prevent armed assault. This happens in a number of places on Pine Ridge. One of the places that it happened was a a location called the Jumping Bull property. It's owned by the Jumping Bull family near Oglala. A, a, an AIM uh, security group called Northwest AIM, headed by three people, Leonard Peltier, Bob Rabadou, and Dino Butler, was provided, there were about eight AIM members there, to provide security to the Jumping Bulls. This becomes a point of attack by the FBI. There's a number of stories that are brought out to explain why a pair of agents went in there two times in two days in order to uh, interact, shall we say, with the AIM people inside, all of which turned out to be false. What appears to have happened is that they sent two agents, Jack Kohler and Ron Williams, onto the Jumping Bull property under a pretext of serving a warrant on a guy they knew wasn't there in order to provoke an armed altercation with the people who were inside who were expected to be eight fighters. Once the fighting broke out, then they expected to be reinforced by an approximate 150 SWAT trained personnel that were pre-positioned in the immediate area and they'd just roll up the AIM camp. But they would also have a sensational incident that would allow the FBI to bring extraordinary force to bear on the reservation to finish this off once and for all, this little war they had going. Because they hadn't been able to destroy the movement, they had not been able to destroy the resistance despite the degree of physical pain that had been inflicted over the preceding two and a half years didn't work out. There were about 30 Indians there instead of eight. The two agents got cut off from their expected reinforcements. They got killed. It's not known with any clarity outside of the American Indian movement who it was that killed the agents. It is known within the Indian movement who killed the agents, which is to say it is known that an individual that I was referring to earlier uh, sitting in prison for that act, Leonard Peltier, did not pull the trigger that killed the agents. He was involved in the firefight, but he was not the killer. Ultimately, you have a whole kind of show trial that would be worthy of Joe Stalin in the Soviet Union. You have essentially a showpiece trial, a kangaroo trial, in order to put someone in jail for this. That someone ends up being Leonard Peltier, who was felt to be, by the people who tried him, by the FBI, by the courts, be a significant figure in the resistance. And what they wanted to symbolize was the kind of punishment, the consequences that would be inflicted on anyone who resisted armed incursion by the forces of the United States in Indian country, that these would be cost prohibitive and that ultimately no one would want to do it. Leonard Peltier therefore symbolizes the ability of the federal government to impose its will upon oppressed people and get away with it, make it stick. Conversely, should we be able to get him out of this cage that they put him in for this act that he did not commit, he would symbolize our ability basically to arrive at an opposite outcome, to deny them the prerogative to imposing their will upon peoples at whim. So he's taken on a life and a meaning and a dimension that, that transcends himself and his individual case. Now that, that's what the movie is about and that's the context in which it, it occurred. So, so for years you've been 
turning out a free Peltier campaign. And has it had any positive consequences? Do you see any possibility that this might work, that he might actually either get another trial and possibly be exonerated or simply be freed? Well, the stakes of this are very high, mm -hmm. okay, partly because of the symbolic reasons that I was talking about. If he were to emerge from the prison as a free man, then it would symbolize that the government cannot sustain the kinds of consequences it needs to sustain in order to be able to, without any appreciable resistance at all, visit these kinds of horrific policies on people year in, year out, generation in, generation out, and at this point century in, century out. So it would be a very negative symbol from their point of view. The other thing is the way that the case has been handled and the context in which this occurred. Should he come out, should there be a breach in this, this insistence that the guilt is on the side opposite the government, then you open several lines of potential criminal culpability for people within U.S. police and intelligence agencies and in governmental positions that run out into fairly high levels, so they're not really comfortable with that. It also suggests major error on the part of the U.S. judiciary, possible collusion and complicity in a cover-up, uh, the factual circumstances of a case, the leaving of a human being as a bona fide uncontestable political prisoner, perhaps prisoner of war in a U.S. institution, something they've been loath to do. You see the ramifications right, right, string out. Right, right, right. On the other hand, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals has acknowledged the fact that the evidentiary chain by which he was convicted of murder in the first place no longer exists. Consequently, he is not validly incarcerated for murder. He's entitled to retrial. The prosecution has argued that he was not convicted of murder, although that was their case that was presented. The evidentiary rulings at trial follow the line of thinking that he's being tried as a principal and the closing argument of the prosecutor at trial was that he in fact did it. The Eighth Circuit Court as a result of that concluded he was not in prison for aiding and abetting in a murder either. He's not in prison for murder, at least not validly so. He's not in prison as a result of having been tried and convicted of aiding and abetting in a murder. The only question I didn't answer is if that's the case, what's he in prison for? There's an appeal going before the court again for oral arguments on the 9th of November, particularly on that basis. There's some other elements involved, but the, the focus is going to be right there as a habeas corpus appeal. Deliver the body if you can't explain why you have the body locked up, basically. Well, the and Supreme, they can't. The Supreme Court before disallowed another uh, trial. The Supreme Court's denied cert yeah. on Peltier's case twice without explaining why. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the first appeal, there were 31 reversible errors found in the record, okay? The head of the three-judge panel of the Eighth Circuit Court who heard the first appeal decided nonetheless, despite the fact that he had 31 potential opportunities to reverse and send this back to trial, that he would not do so. The judge's name who headed the panel was William Webster. By the time oh. the opinion was read, he had already left his position in the Eighth Circuit to assume directorship of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Of the 31 reversible errors, 19 involved FBI misconduct and there was an obvious, very high interest in part of the FBI as an institution to see a conviction in this case because it involved the deaths of two of its agents. So you can sort of see where that one went. The Supreme Court refused to review that case. The second appeal resulted in what I was talking about, the determination that there was not a valid murder conviction and that he had not been convicted of aiding and abetting. No suggestion as to why he would be in prison other than to reverse would take a record which they acknowledge is being fraught with FBI misconduct and imputing further misconduct to the Bureau, which the court was reluctant to do. So rather than impute misconduct to an agency they already acknowledged had exceeded the bounds of propriety, authority, and perhaps legality, they left a human being sitting in, in a prison cell, a maximum security prison cell, for no appreciable reason at all. We'll see what happens the next time. But on the last time, the Supreme Court refused Cert refused to review the case despite the fact that one of the arguments the Eighth Circuit had entered was that presented with evidence that was now on the record, a jury might possibly have entered a different verdict. They maintained that in order to reverse it was required that they conclude that a jury would probably have reached a different verdict. This was based on a Supreme Court case called Bagley 
and the Ninth Circuit Court had already determined that the possibility of a different verdict was sufficient to cause reversal, so you got an inequitable standard of application of law there, something which structurally requires a Supreme Court right. clarification, and they refused to clarify their own case if they had to review Peltier to do it. So that's our situation here. There are compelling reasons why I should say this case will be resolved if there's any modicum of justice involved in the American judicial system. But on the other hand, the political realities and the history of the case strongly suggest that there will not. It's going to take a good deal more expression of popular outrage at the nature of justice reflected in this case, I think, before either politically or judicially or both the United States is systemically moved to do something about it to affect justice. And meanwhile, Amnesty International still has uh, Leonard Peltier as listed as one of America's political prisoners. As a political prisoner, but not a prisoner of conscience. If he was dead, he would be a prisoner of conscience. Well, he would be a victim of whatever it was that caused him to be a person of conscience, I guess. Under amnesty rules, he cannot be adopted as a uh, prisoner of conscience because he had the audacity to defend himself against armed attack. And apparently, under their rubric, you're not oh, supposed yeah. to do that. And he's acknowledged that he did, in fact, participate in the firefight, that he fired at the agents. That's the same with the ACLU. They won't get involved in it because there was uh, uh, some type of uh, uh, armed conflict involved, right? Well, ACLU has managed to become involved in, in several cases, involved armed conflict when there were extreme right-wing organizations right. at issue. Right. And they've gone increasingly that direction. <laughs> I won't draw any further conclusions yeah. as to what that means, but the ACLU has to live with itself. Peltier... I want to put this forward clearly, is not a good shot. He fired from a distance and acknowledged that. His acknowledgement of his participation is simply an honest statement. Yes, I fired in self-defense. He has said, and is corroborated by everyone who was there, that he didn't hit anybody for the simple reason he was probably not capable of hitting anyone. He was firing <laughs> wild every time. One of his co-defendants, Bob Rabadou, on the other hand, has stated quite clearly on the record during his trial, I shot them both. <laughs> All right? The first rounds that went into each agent were from a 44 Magnum Ruger rifle, fired at distance. Hmm. As Rabadou testified, I was the only one with a 44 Mag. Both of the initial wounds were mortal wounds. Bob Rabadou has, in effect, said, I killed them both. They would have been dead. And he was acquitted by a jury, an all-white jury in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, of any wrongdoing based on the fact that he had reason to fear for the safety of himself and the safety of those around him, given the reign of terror which had been objectively perpetrated by the FBI on that reservation in prosecution of the state of war that we were talking about. This is a very middle American jury. Found Rabadou and his co-defendant, Dino Butler, who both acknowledged having fired at the agents and, and Rabadou of having hit them mortally of any wrongdoing, no murder, self-defense. This is a jury speaking. This is a federal case, the same case for which Peltier was subsequently tried. And you, note, you have a jury of middle American, rednecks, if you will, who reached a conclusion that no murders had occurred. Self-defense and murder are mutually exclusive propositions. So if no murders had occurred, that was a jury determination. One has to ask the question of why they took Leonard Peltier to trial at all. Loan me a minute, let me borrow your ear, and I'll sing you a song about Leonard Peltier. He's gone so long in a federal jail, and there ain't no way that you could pay his bail. In South Dakota, where the fear has grown, where the president's a watch from a mountain of stone, they say all people are free to roam. There ain't no freedom in the Indian home. How many have gone before? And tell me how many more must be lost to the Indian wars? Company spoke to the high command We need the deeds to the Indian land To dig for oil and uranium ore Maybe have to start a little Indian war The orders came from away on high And it was a job for the FBI It won't be hard, all we'll have to do Is cause a little trouble and follow it through How many have gone before, and tell me how many more must be lost.
lost to the Indian War. And Leonard Peltier was one of those who came to the call when the time arose. And dangerous strangers were prowling around, bringing trouble to the reservation ground. In Oglala, where the spirit did dwell, it was the time they remember well. There were women and children gathered there when the wind blew a warning through the whispering air. And that was when the agents made their play in a gunshot battle on a deadly day. And three men died in the hollow sand to FBI and an Indian man. How many have gone before? And tell me how many more must be lost to the Indian War. Joe Spence was a man that died that day But the eyes of the law didn't see it that way All they cared about was their own kind Gonna get somebody for a capital crime The charge was set for homicide But Leonard got away to the Canada side Where he lived for a while in the northern town Till they came up and got him and brought him back down Judge and the jury, they both agreed Two times murder in the first degree They pounded the gavel and they rang on the bell Two times life in a federal cell Citations came from Washington Congratulations on a job well done Two agents gone is a mighty price But if you want something bad, you gotta sacrifice Leonard Peltier is a captured man with both legs taken so he cannot stand. One more swallowed by the master plan to get their hands on the Indian land. How many have gone before? And tell me how many more must be lost to the Indian war? And so it's been since days of old when Custer died for a mountain of gold. But times have changed and passed them by. They've been replaced by the FBI. Oh, it's all so easy to weep and mourn for a warfare fought so far from home. You can preach of peace from a righteous stand, but there ain't no peace on the Indian land. was a lower down the winds did blow with a mighty sound and the answer came in the driving rain this man shall not have died in vain for the hollow power of the lock and key ain't nothing to the power of the raging sea where the lightning strikes in the angry skies that puts the power into people's eyes mighty storm and the words in the wind that come to warn are once more spoken to your ear only this time the name is a leonard peltier how many have gone before and tell me how many more must be lost to the indian war We turn now to the plight of Native Americans from South America. In this instance, Peru. What happens when the oil companies come calling? For your information, due to time constraints, I've deleted some translated sections. We've seen in various parts of the world what happens when oil companies move in to the ecology, to the people of the area, and to the economy. Most of us don't realize that the situation is now occurring in Peru where a lot of oil exploration is going on in the Amazon basin, 
and wreaking havoc with the ecology and with the indigenous people there. Well, we'll find out more about this on Alternative Views because we have one of the people who is actually closely involved and has uh, been living in the area where the oil companies have been uh, exploring and drilling. Emir Etstam Nunquan. Emir is a member of the Awaruna people who are where the area of drilling and all is focused and we'll be talking with him about what is going on. He is a member of COICA, which is an acronym for the Coordinating Body of Indigenous Peoples Organizations of the Amazon Basin. Our interpreter is Edward Hammond, who is with the University of Texas Institute for Latin American Studies. What is actually happening in Peru right now with the oil companies? Bueno, las compañías petroleras the petroleum companies después de tener una negociación con las organizaciones representativas after having negotiated with the representative organizations of the indigenous people antes de eso las compañías sin ninguna previa consulta a las organizaciones representativas de Aguaruna y Guambisa uh, the, the companies have entered without previously seeking the approval of the Aguaruna and Guambisa people ahora bueno han entrado nuestro pueblo y están este, explorando. Now they've entered into our land and they're exploring for oil. How large an area is this? ¿De qué tamaño es el área? La área es de un millón de hectáreas. There is at one million hectares. What oil companies are involved? The companies are Edward Cowan Interest and Halliburton Geophysical Services. Now Halliburton is well known. It's an enormous uh, global corporation. But what's the other one again? Edward Cowan Interest. They are a. Uh, they're Houston. They're both. They're both the companies are from Houston, Texas. Hmm. Uh, what? Now they are just exploring now, not drilling. They've, they've entered and they've started to build what will be 150 heliports. Yeah, y abriendo trochas de 175 kilómetros. Por dos metros de ancho. And building uh, at least 175 kilometers of two meter wide paths through the jungle. Uh, are they bringing uh, any type of colonists, so to speak, with them, or is just the oil company people, workers themselves? Están trayendo al colonos, las compañías petroleras, o es solamente un problema de los trabajadores de las compañías? Bueno, más que todo tienen este 300 personas quienes están trabajando con ellos, más que todo. There are 300 people that are working with the oil company, but they do also, colonists come on their heels. Are these colonists uh, Anglo uh, uh, from abroad, or are they people from Peru they brought in? Uh, the government sends the colonists, they're, they're campesinos, they're country people that don't have land somewhere else. <clears throat> uh, what has been the effect uh, on the ecology of the area? When the, when the petroleum companies come in, they damage the earth and they poison the rivers. Destruyen el bosque. And they destroy the forest. Y ahuyentan los animales de los cuales es nuestro alimento. And they cause the animals to flee, and those are the same animals that, that we use to feed ourselves. So this has a big impact on your ability to actually continue to live because it uh, destroys your ability to gather food. Uh, these are titled communities and it's a violation of, of clear land rights. What has been the impact on the people so far? Have they gotten sick or have they have difficulty finding food because of this? They bring uh, unknown uh, contagious diseases to the area. Muchos este al entrar los trabajadores con las compañías petroleras Entra en las comunidades. And when the oil company workers arrive and enter into the communities, engañan a las mujeres, dejan los hijos sin padres. Uh, they fool women and leave, uh, leave fatherless children. Y presionada a las hermanas para que sean prostituidas. And, and women uh, sometimes become prostitutes. Oh, because in order to make money to live or to make more money eh, so they can live better. Oil company workers arrive. Uh, it's it's not a matter of choice. They take the women, um, and once the women have been taken, they it, the process goes on. They become prostitutes of the oil company workers. Oh my God! 
Esto fue, bueno, este, las compañías anteriores, venimos nosotros atravesando grandes problemas del año 1968. Con otras compañías anteriores que entraron y viendo todo este tipo de problemas que nosotros atravesamos como pueblos indígenas, And having, having seen it in the past, uh, we as indigenous people, nos expresamos ante las compañías, estas dos compañías, express to those companies that have come, that are coming in now, con su representante de sucursal en el Perú, Petromineros del Perú, uh, to Petromineros del Perú, which is the local subsidiary, y Petro Perú, and Petro Perú, which is another local subsidiary. Tuvimos una reunión el del 4 al 8 de noviembre de octubre with whom we agosto, agosto. With, with whom we had a, a, a meeting between the 4th and the 8th of August para poder manifestarle y dar a conocer por qué los pueblos indígenas Guaruna y Guambisa no aceptan to let them know why we don't accept para their que presence. otras compañías por cuarta vez entre a nuestra tierra a dañar lo que es nuestra casa de donde 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 nosotros sobrevivimos. Let them let them know that this is the fourth time that we know about this. This is the fourth time that all companies have come into our land to destroy our house, to destroy our home where we live. Y compartimos todos los recursos que hay en la Amazonía, pero con mucho respeto. We we share the resources of the Amazon and treat it with respect. Sin destruir el bosque. Without without destroying the forest. Mm -hmm. Uh, has there been force used against uh, the indigenous people there to try to keep them from resisting? Uh, there's a regional representative council called the Aguaruna Wambisa Council, which represents the two affected native peoples. Eh, llegaron, quisieron llegar a un acuerdo para poder evitar la destrucción de la, de la cuenca amazónica tried to arrive at an, at an agreement with the companies to avoid the destruction de Marañón y Río Santiago y Nieva in the, in the Nieva, Marañón and Santiago river basins pero no llegaron ni un acuerdo porque las compañías petroleras escucharon las, este, los reclamos de los pueblos pero they sin did, embargo but they didn't arrive at any agreement although the oil companies listened to the claims of the indigenous people ellos dijeron que aunque no estuvieran de acuerdo los pueblos indígenas, ellos iban a hacer a su manera. They said that even though the indigenous people weren't in agreement with what they were doing, they would continue to do the exploration. Y ahora, como le digo, ya han empezado el trabajo, pero con el respaldo de las fuerzas armadas. And now they've started this work, and they do it with the support of the Peruvian military. Oh, that's the force. Para que los pueblos indígenas no reaccionen una forma rápido para poder despojarlos. To prevent the Peruvian military's presence prevents the indigenous people from reacting and and removing the oil companies from their land. Pero, uh, disculpe, pero hay un malestar creciente. There's a, but there's a growing uh, uneasiness in the indigenous communities. De que cualquier momento la, los pueblos Aguaruna y Guambisa pueden reaccionar contra las compañías. And in any moment it's possible that the Aguarunas and Wambisas may decide to act against the companies. Pero como tienen respaldo de la Fuerza Armada, but puede the, haber muchos derrames de sangre. But because they have the support of the Peruvian military, it could be very bloody. Mm -hmm. Entonces los únicos responsables de estos sucesos serían la compañía petrolera y el gobierno nacional. But if that were to happen, it would be the fault of the petroleum companies and the national government. Mm -hmm. Now, in some parts of the world, like Guatemala or Indonesia, and previously in North America, uh, this problem was taken care of by either killing off all the indigenous people or by mass relocations from the areas that the uh, capitalists were wanting to exploit. Is this uh, a possibility also? Más que todo, hay mucha colonización en los pueblos indígenas como en Brasil, como en Bolivia, como en Ecuador. There's a, there's a lot of colonization on indigenous people's lands in, in Brazil, in Ecuador, in Bolivia. Todavía venimos enfrentados a muchos problemas porque hay todavía, porque nosotros aún existen un millón y medio de, un millón de indígenas amazónicos despejo, despojados de sus territorios tradicionales. And we continue to encounter these problems. Uh, there, there are a million of the Amazon's native people who have been kicked off of their land. Que compartimos como auténticos pueblos. That, a land that they shared as an authentic people. Mm -hmm. 
y muchas veces nos quieren arrinconar nos, en unas pequeñas comunidades aisladas. And what they want to do is to corner us in small, little, isolated communities. Eso es lo que hacen los gobiernos That's de cada do. país. Uh, tell me, apparently the uh, resistance is uh, taking effect by uh, people who are involved in COICA, the Coordinating Body of Indigenous Peoples Organizations of the Amazon Basin. Can you tell us about that? Eh, ¿Se puede hablar sobre la COICA, lo que es, y qué papel está, eh, qué papel tiene en, eh, en la lucha para proteger eh, su pueblo? La coordinadora de las organizaciones indígenas de la cuenca amazónica fue fundada en Lima en 1984 por las organizaciones indígenas nacionales by the National Indigenous Peoples Organizations de Colombia, of Colombia de Bolivia, Bolivia Perú, Perú y Brasil, and Brazil. para que la COICA sea un refuerzo representativo a nivel internacional so that COICA was founded to be a international representative of the indigenous people para reforzar y defender los derechos territoriales to, to defend their land rights y en protección del bosque tropical and to protect the tropical rainforest have they had much uh, positive results yet? ha tenido la COICA resultados positivos tiene una, un convenio firmado con las ciudades europeas, con los grupos ambientalistas. Um, they, have, they have agreements signed with environmentalist groups and uh, with some European communities that have been interested in their cause. Yo quisiera hacer un llamado por medio de este canal que tengo la oportunidad para poder llegar a diferentes opiniones públicas, más que todo de defensores de derechos humanos y en protectores de bosque Amazon, eh, bueno, de la Amazonía. On this channel or on, on this station, I would like to issue a call to the people that are interested in saving the Amazon rainforest to environmentalists. Y bueno, los ambientalistas que existen en esta ciudad para que puedan tomar una conciencia y ya queremos ver su trabajo de ellos, ya que ellos dicen que son defensores de derechos humanos y ambientalistas that they should take an interest in this, um, that as defenders of the forest, uh, this should be something that, that they should uh, be conscious of and should, and should be active about. Well, there are other, two other factors that we hear so much about Peru, uh, drug trafficking and the guerrilla movements. Uh, uh, are any of these two factors involved at all in the area that we're talking about? A problem that we have with, that come from these groups happen when the oil companies come in and build roads. Entra mucha colonización. Colonists enter on those roads. Después de terminar el trabajo, ellos desean quedarse en la, en la, en la Amazonía. And after the oil work is done, the colonists stay. Entonces, viendo eso, queremos evitarlo, porque al, al, no solamente entran los colonos, sino también los cocaleros. And not only do colonists enter, but but cocoa growers and cocoa processors come in the drug trade. Y para no vernos involucrados en eso, en esos casos, queremos evitarlo. And so we want to avoid the construction of the road because we don't want to have anything to do with that type of business. Y queremos la total desaprobación de las compañías petroleras que están haciendo sus trabajos. So what we're asking for is the is the complete withdrawal of the petroleum companies. What about the guerrilla movements? I would think that uh, the Shining Path or other guerrilla organizations would find this a fertile area for them to come in and try to uh, get assistance and help the people and also be supported by the people. No, no tenemos no respaldo de los, de las, como se llama, este, de los levantados en arma. No, we don't, we don't have the, the support of people who are, who are rising up in arms, uh, meaning, the, meaning the Sendero or the MRTA. Porque no queremos nosotros involucrarnos en su política de ellos. Because we don't want to become involved in their politics. Porque nuestra política es autodefenderse entre indígenas y nuestro propio autodesarrollo. Because our, our policy, um, our politics are for, are for self-defense and for self-development. 
What uh, type of self self development are we talking about? ¿Qué tipo de autodesarrollo? Bueno, nuestro autodesarrollo es muy diferente como se desarrolla en las ciudades. Uh, our our self development autodesarrollo is very different. It's not like uh, what you would find in cities. Nuestro desarrollo no es a costa, no es de mayor rentabilidad. Our development isn't one for the greatest profit. A costa de nuestras tierras, sino uh, a costa de nuestras tierras, no es un este, eh, ¿cómo puedo decir este? En la ganancia que nosotros queremos obtener, como los la gente que tiene sus pequeños propietarios que están temerosos por las subidas y bajadas de los precios del mercado. Uh, we we don't want to be a people of that's a bunch of small landowners that are that are victimized or scared of the rise and fall of markets. Mm -hmm. Porque nuestro desarrollo no es para obtener plata para comprarnos una lata de atún. Because our development isn't about getting money in order to buy a can of tuna fish. <laughs> para poder este, compartir a nuestra familia porque nosotros estamos acostumbrados a consumir peichi y zungaros. Uh, we don't want to provide that sort of thing to our family. We're accustomed to eating paiche and zungaro, which are two very tasty fish from the rivers around there. Nuestro desarrollo no es para dominar, sino para compartir. Our development is not for domination, it's to share. Nuestro desarrollo no es, no es para, para desarrollar como en las ciudades, sino nuestro desarrollo es un desarrollo íntegro de cada pueblo indígena. Our development is integral. It's an integral kind of development that's not like what takes place in cities. Eso es nuestro desarrollo y queremos que eso sea reconocido y respetado. That's, that's how we see development and we want that to be recognized and respected. And that's Alternative Views for this time. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to thank our crew for making our program possible. Brian Lynch, Ashley Blake, Murray McDowell, and for our news section, Kevin L. West and Eric Eubank. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. So that's our address. If you'd like to write to us, we'd love to hear from you. Goodbye.